Good morning, everyone. Welcome you all to the fourth day of SESTEC 2020. We are going to start the technical session 10. I request all the participants to switch off the video. And if you have any query, please send it through the co-host to uh, send it through the chat box to the host SESTEC 2020. It is my pleasant duty to introduce the chairperson of this session, Professor S. Kannan. Professor Kannan is an outstanding scientist and head field chemistry division. He's from 29th batch of BRC training school. He's an expert in production of strategic materials for alloy fuel pre preparation, chemical quality control of nuclear fuel materials, coordination chemistry of actinides, lanthanides, and transition metals. He has more than 115 publications in peer-reviewed journals to his credit. He is a fellow of National Academy of Sciences and he is a recipient of several prestigious awards, including the Homibhava Science and Technology Award 2011, Haldar Memorial Award, Indian Chemical Society 1991. I request Professor Kannan to kindly chair this session. Thank you, Simona, for your introduction. So in this session, we have two speakers in our talk. And the first speaker is Dr. Chanjai Pandavatyaya. He is a vice president in the uh, Biotech Division, Diodize, Padilla Health Center, Health Care Limited. He is post doctor from University of California at San Diego, California. And he is a member of American Chemical Society in 2003. And he has had 16 patents and several international publications. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Pandopathyaya he is expert in the field of protein biochemistry. And he has developed both the different therapeutic and protein fertile products, including a novel preparation of antirabies and monoclonal antibiotics, and which are commercially approved products in India. With this introduction, I would like to invite Dr. Sanjay Pandavatyaya on his uh, lecture on preparation of preparation of recombinant monoclonal antibodies. Dr. Sanjay Pandavatyaya, please. <coughs> Dr. Bandavada, you are now presenter. Kindly unmute yourself and share your presentation, please. You can hear me perfectly and the uh, slide still not shared okay it's getting shared it's visible it's, shared. Visible. it's visible can you change one slide please Did it change? Yes, it's working. It's working. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me for this talk. Um, and good morning, all of you. So the topic that I'm going to talk about today about the separation of recombinant monoclonal antibody, as you know, which is a hot topic nowadays in the biopharmaceutical industry. And uh, this slide basically, uh, tells us about what are monoclonal antibodies. So they are known as immunoglobulins. What is the specialty of these molecules? Uh, they have very defined specificity for particular antigen. And therefore, sometimes we call them magic bullet. Uh, and they are derived from specific you know, cell lines also, which you know, technically we call monoclonal cell line. And in today's day, you know, since the first antibody which was approved by FDA in back in the year 1986, more than now 60 monoclonal antibodies have been uh, approved for various uh, disease indications, mainly for cancer and for immunotherapy, and also in some cases where reversal for the reversal of drug effects like after uh, surgery or grafting, when some rejection happens, then antibodies, they help the body immune system 
to cope up with the situation. And uh, as I uh, told you that it has been more than three decades that the first antibody was introduced in the market as an approved product. So the, the protein engineering related to uh, monoclonal antibody also uh, evolved uh, in this manner that from murine to chimeric to humanized and human. Why the scientists, they have done so because uh, if you have more human antibodies, then it will be more physiological. Therefore, it will have less adverse effects and better safety profile. So these molecules are protein in nature. Uh, I am on slide three, and uh, these are pretty complex. As you see the representative structure of a monoclonal antibody, uh, it is mainly composed of two copies of heavy chain and two copies of light chain. The heavy chains are normally glycosylated. That's the physiological event that happens within the cell. And because they are large, so it, 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 you can see the molecular weight is very big, very large, 150 kilo Dalton about. And because it is large molecules, so mother nature had made them in such a manner so that they can hold together, hold together uh, in the assembled form through the disulfide bridges, which are covalent in nature. Uh, these monoclonal antibodies, they have to remain in the systemic circulation for long, and they have to travel for a long time in the circulation. So they need to be stable. And in order to provide that stability, again, the protein gets folded mainly with the beta sheets conformation, which stabilizes the molecule at very high concentration and in different, you know, adverse situation. And of course, large molecule, and therefore the complexity would be much higher due to heterogeneity, and that gets, uh, you know, uh, that that happens because of a lot of post-translational modifications, as you see here, uh, given with some examples like N-terminal heterogeneity with the formation of pyroglutamate on glutamine amino acid residue then glutamine deamidation, then some methionine residues can get oxidized. Uh, lysine side chain epsilon amine group are very vulnerable uh, for glycation in the presence of a reducing sugar. The glycosylation, which is also a part of uh, your uh, post-translational modification, is uh, very beneficial for the molecule because it protects the region of this molecule from crosstalk, protein-protein crosstalk, and it does not expose the hydrophobic uh, regions or patches of the protein so that they don't undergo protein aggregation much. And then there is a heavy chain terminal lysine heterogeneity. These regions of the antibodies are very important as it is indicated on the left panel. So you have a variable region which uh, helps in the detection, identification of the antigen to go and bind. And the antibody, antigen, this, this portion is also uh, a part of antigen binding domain. So although many of the maps, they come out from the same framework, but they will be different from each other because of these regions. And these regions, that's why also are having the complement dependent uh, that region, uh, you have, we call it uh, CDR region. Then it has hinge region, mainly uh, the hinge region has some disulfide bonds, uh, which bring some flexibility of the molecule sometimes. And then there is a conserved region called FC region. This portion is important for many reasons, like cell killing activity for receptor function, and also it binds to some receptor in human uh, plasma, uh, which eventually, you know, keeps the molecule uh, uh, for long, longer period of time in the systemic circulation. It gives the plasma half-life better. So you know now that the complexity, how, how the complex molecule we are talking about. So for their separation, uh, 
uh, in laboratory. Normally, the conventional column chromatography uh, technique is used for purification of the mats. And the purification process involves uh, membrane ultrafiltration, diafiltration, because these molecules, they come out from mammalian cells, so there are potential uh, risk of viral uh, contamination. So therefore, one has to have dedicated viral inactivation and clearance step in the process. No matter what you do, your purified protein should be highly uh, purified in terms of the level of purity should not be less than 99%. That's what our aim is so that your product related impurities, the level of those impurities, they don't exceed certain range like it is shown here. And because it is coming out from a host cell, so there will be a lot of contaminants from the host cell and one has to control the level of those host cell contaminating proteins or DNA or process related impurities uh, that comes out from one of the column chromatography step very, very carefully. And uh, the process should be able to reduce as at least six log virus reduction so that uh, at the end, when you actually present the product to a patient, uh, there is a thumb rule that one virus particle can be present in one million doses form, not more than that. So very, very uh, tight. Uh, control that one has to have. So how people they or scientists they purify the monoclonal antibodies. So there are many different ways one can do it, but there is a common platform technology that probably majority of the MAP processes they have, which is called the affinity chromatography, known as protein A chromatography. It binds to the protein and then at a particular pH it eludes the protein out of the column. Because the FC portion of the maps is common for all the IgG and protein A, this molecule protein A ligand comes from Staphylococcus, recombinantly produced nowadays. It has a specific affinity to the FC portion. So any molecule that has the FC region can bind to protein A selectively, and that helps in purification. So if we now focus on the, the middle one, uh, designated with one, process one. So you'll see that the purification then uh, uh, goes on with a low pH viral inactivation followed by ion exchange chromatography, a series of ion exchange chromatography, and then finally the polishing step to get the active drug substance. But this is not the only way one can purify the protein. Although they have some, they share common features, but Remember I said the CDR region that, that uh, it distinguishes the molecule. So every molecule is unique and different from the other one. So one has to really uh, optimize the process to get the best result. So these are examples that one can also purify the protein by following the path process two or following the path process three or following the path process four or following the path process five. And how they are different from each other, principally the involvement of uh, some new column chromatography technology. We call it uh, mixed mode chromatography or multimodality, uh, uh, multimodal uh, functionality uh, column matrix or uh, hydrophobic chromatography. In different uh, order, one can use them to get the best result eventually. And the process is also uh, having one step, which is dedicated virus clearance. One step is dedicated viral inactivation at low pH. Another is dedicated virus clearance by nanofiltration. Based on the size, it can be separated on. So I will be talking about some of the case studies that we have gone through while developing many antibodies uh, uh, in Jidus Research Center but center around this particular template slide. So going to the next slide. Did the slide change? Here it got stuck.
Okay. So do you get to see slide number six? Okay, so uh, so protein A, I already mentioned, it's, it is uh, a protein from Staphylococcus. It is being liganded on a solid support called agarose and it binds to the FC region. So what is the mechanism of binding of protein um, IgG and the protein A is both the molecules, they have some conserved histidine residues and at neutrality, they actually stack against each other. And, and this binding is reversible binding, not, not a very strong binding. Otherwise you cannot dislodge them uh, during illusion. But when you lower the pH because the pK value of the histidine side chain imidazole ring will be now more protonated. So they will be having positively charged uh, you know, side chain and there will be electro electrostatic repulsion that will lead to the release of the bound protein A, uh, bound IgG from protein A. Uh, now, it is very easy that one can purify an antibody by uh, just using protein A. But this protein A chromatography, because uh, it has an exposure of low pH uh, during purification. So sometimes for some IgG, it shows some adverse effect in terms of formation of aggregates. So I'll show you two different cases. One is MAV A purification by protein A chromatography. As you see here, this is the chromatography profile. So most of the contaminating proteins, they came out in the flow through after some intermediate wash when we elude the protein, then it comes with a single peak with a very good step recovery of 90%. And this column step removes almost greater than 5,000, I mean, uh, fold removal of the contaminating proteins and leading to very high uh, level of uh, IgG, pure IgG, like here it shows 99.81%. This is just by one column, uh, you know, process step. But this particular sample, eluded sample, when we analyze by reducing uh, or non-reducing SDS page under denaturing condition, you can see that. Okay, so here is the load before purification. You see so many bands. Here is the column wash, where as expected, you uh, find most of the contaminating proteins. It comes out, does not, they do not bind to the column matrix. And in the eluted fraction, you get a fairly relatively pure uh, protein of interest. But why relatively pure here? We say that there are multiple bands you see. But the same sample, when it gets analyzed under reduced condition, then you'll see the number of bands it reduces, the heterogeneity reduces, and it gets focused mainly with the heavy chain and light chain of the immunoglobulin. So this is a typical immunoglobulin. You cannot get a single band pure protein because mother nature has made these proteins heterogeneous. So there are size variants. What is very interesting, when you take these samples and analyze under native condition by analytical size exclusion chromatography, you find uh, a, a major peak with 99.8% purity. What does it indicate? That all these size variants, they remain assembled in the native form. So there is no concern. It is very pure. In another case, the MAM here B, it's a different MAM. After purification by protein A at low pH and during viral inactivation, clearly showed the formation of aggregates as a function of time as it was assessed by size exclusion chromatography. You can see that within an hour time, you get about 8% uh, aggregates. And in two hours time, it almost touches 10% aggregates which is not good thing to have in the final product. So what did you do then? So you have to now, in the purification design, the next column step for the removal of this excess amount of aggregates. So here, for one example, we show with map B, where we used a mixed mode column chromatography in the bind dilute mode, and the ligand of the chromatography uh, system is having a benzyl ring with the quaternary ammonia group, why it is mixed mode? Because you have uh, positively charged as well as hydrophobic ring. So this chromatography 
helps you to have the protein binding on the basis of ionic interaction, hydrogen bonding, and hydrophobic interaction. So when it was eluted in the, uh, uh, from the column, and as you see here, the eluted pig, and uh, when we collect the fraction one, which is a major part of the eluted pig, then we find that here you can see fraction one uh, by HPSEC analysis, the purity increased many, very significantly from 80% to 98.5%, while removing the excess aggregates or high molecular weight species, either in the later fraction or in a separate wash post elution, as it is indicated with this peak. You can see this peak fraction shows such a uh, high level of uh, aggregation. So this differential separation helps you to have a fairly pure protein, uh, which can be used for therapeutic purpose. In another case, a map C, where after the protein A, column chromatography, the purity was fairly high, as high as 99.77%. We intended to further improve the purity by the same mixed mode column. But this time, the column mode of action was different. We uh, figured out that instead of doing it in the bind dilute mode, if we do a flow through mode, then we can improve the purity further without any significant loss of protein of interest. So step recovery was very good. And as it shows here that in the uh, uh, flow through and wash mode, the protein of interest, it shows flat, almost flat here, where normally the high molecular aggregates, they do appear. And then later on, the aggregates, they came out uh, all from the column matrix. So this is another way to purify. And I want to remind all of you that you know, an improvement from 99.7 to 99.9 .9 normally is not an easy task, although it's a small uh, increment, but it is very significant. So this column chromatography not only helps in a reduction of the product-related impurities, it does also uh, helps you to reduce substantially the process-related impurities like host cell contaminating protein. Remember I said, in the protein A column step, you get rid of most of the host cell contaminating proteins greater than 5,000 fold, sometimes 10,000 fold. But when you do in the mixed mode step, you further reduces the uh, host cell contaminating proteins several fold here with, with MAV A, the example shows about 140 fold. And it comes to point less than, less than actually one PPN, very good. Now, uh, purification is not limited just by mixed mode column chromatography. So normal one dimensional, uh, you know, HIC column chromatography matrix like phenyl cephalos classically known can al also be very helpful in the bind dilute mode and step recovery is, is also good. This is a map D, a different case, a different map where you can see that the purity uh, has been improved from 97.57% to 99.62% as desired. So this can be also used instead of mixed mode column chromatograph. But it all depends on the molecule that you are handling, they are unique. So then I talked about the removal of aggregates. MAPs are, I said MAPs are heterogeneous, they are complex. So another level of complexity that arises is due to the different charge uh, species variants that are present in MAP. So we call, we tell them charge heterogeneity. So typically in MAPs, they have acidic isoforms, they have basic isoforms, and they have a main you know, principal uh, peak, which is unmodified. So here in this, at, uh, this case, what we are showing, that by using cation exchange chromatography, which is mainly based out of the sulfopropyl ligand uh, uh, you know, interaction, one can uh, remove substantially the additional or extra charge variants. So as you can see in the process chromatography, the protein came out with a peak and it was fractionated as fraction one and two. They were analyzed, they were analyzed by uh, high performance ion exchange chromatography, analytical scale, 
and as you see here, so the load, the crude sample was showing a peak over here, which we did not want to have in our product. By using this chromatography and differentially fractionating the eluted protein, we could get rid of this peak in the final product as shown here. And where did we actually remove them? In the later fraction during elution, as you see, the, the basic ice, one of the basic isoforms came out largely in that fraction. So ion exchange chromatography is very helpful. So this way, finally you reach, uh, you know, the active drug substance, which we call the finally purified drug substance, which goes into the drug product uh, format. But this in industry in today's day, the practice is uh, quite extensive because you have to ensure that the quality of the product is checked by every means as uh, as deep as analysis of primary structure of protein, secondary and higher order structure, physicochemical properties, all sorts of like size variants, charge variants, then hydrophobic variants. Also, you have to assess the carbohydrate structure. Then, of course, the functional and biological properties. But the list does not end here. Here I am showing the quality attributes associated with these molecules, the parameters involved in the assessment of their uh, uh, properties and the techniques involved in uh, assessing those properties. So in industry for therapeutic proteins, uh, one has to do the degradation studies that helps you to understand the structural integrity and its stability as it is going to be a, presented in a vial or in a syringe for two years time, right? Uh, the self life has to be two years normally. So one has to ensure that your product is going to remain stable by many means. So, so degradation studies we do like with chemical denaturation, with freeze-thaw stress, because during transport and shipment, sometimes the product undergoes repeated freezing and thawing events. So one has to ensure the product they don't or they uh, the product does not go bad. During shipment, the product will undergo severe shaking or agitation. You have to ensure the product does not go back under this situation. So your formulation has to be uh, very important there and crucial to stabilize the protein structure. And the list goes on in terms of forced chemical oxidation. Methionine is known to have oxidation in the micro environment of protein. You have to have some protection wherever required in terms of having a formulation excipients which can protect the methionine from oxidation. Then force deamidation, chemical deamidation of glutamine, which are very susceptible. And also the products in vials or syringes, they can be always exposed to light. So you have to check the photo degradation. Again, the relevant parameters to be checked and the techniques should be the right kind of technique to assess the differences between the modified and the unmodified protein. So uh, some of the you know, uh, results that I'm showing, why it is important, uh, the batch to batch uh, consistency is very important. We showed you the purification process. We showed you how we characterize, but then it is expected that each batch come out in the same manner. Here it shows the structural properties of a particular map that was purified through the template process described above and the first panel shows the far UVCD spectroscopy, which shows the secondary structure. Maps normally uh, are uh, very uh, characteristically, they show the beta conformation with an absorbance minima at around 200 nanometer, 18 nanometer. When you analyze the same maps, they show characteristic amide one, you know, the, the band, which again signifies the presence of beta conformation the tertiary structure and the higher order structure by spectrophotometry and by differential scanning calorimetry shows these maps are very stable as you see. The degradation or denaturation starts only at high temperature uh, in two steps for this particular map at 68 degrees centigrade and 77 degrees centigrade. You, you, you should not have any worry about the maps when it reaches to the hospital or clinic because they are being always transported under cold chain. And here we are showing the maps denatures 
actually they denature at very high temperature. So they're stable molecule. And as you see the, the spectra, they are overlapping with each other, that they are coming out from different batches. So that clearly indicates that uh, the batch to batch consistency in terms of quality. So it's a lot of activities. In the last 10 years in Jigas, I have been involved in the development of such products. So far, we were uh, successful to develop and launch uh, monoclonal antibodies like Adalimumab, indicated for rheumatoid arthritis in the inflammation you know, area, Trastuzumab for breast cancer, Bevacizumab for colorectal cancer. Now, there are quite a few number of other maps like Reduximab, uh, trastuzumab in dancing. This is going to be a very interesting molecule in the market. This would be antibody drug conjugate for the breast cancer patient who are already showing resistance to trastuzumab. Uh, so we, if we, we are, we are expecting to launch it very in the next couple of weeks. We'll be the first in the world as a biosimilar, uh, you know, trastuzumab in dancing to launch from Jidas in India. In India. Then we'll have other maps, as you see, for mostly for oncology or onco-indications in the uh, years to come. So uh, this is going to be my last slide of the presentation. And if you have any specific question, I'll be happy to answer this. And again, thank you for inviting me for this speech. And uh, thank you once again. I have completed my speech. It's a mute for me. Okay, in our BARC, uh, we have a division called radio pharmaceutical. They use a radio label monoclonal antibody. So, in what way that is better than liver? Uh, this one? Okay, the purpose is remains same. Okay, particularly, this one is trans and reduced CMAP. This is under two, they label it with uh, the isotope, they will use. Can you hear us? Professor Bandar, can you hear us? Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Was there a question? Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, we are working on radio leveled monochrome. Right? There are some papers, three papers on that. So in your case, the radiation particular uh, level, I said the level one of the number of the is helpful. Come out a normal one. The purpose remains here to treat the cancer. I, uh, I'm sorry, sir. I could not really hear you okay. properly. Your question is on reduximab that I could make out. Yeah, um, that is radio level antibody. One of the antibody. Okay. One... Yes, please uh, try again. See, there are radio labeled uh, monoclonal antibody. Yes. yes. So, in what way it is advantageous to overcome the normal? Okay. So, I think. Uh, when you do the radio leveling, uh, the those radio level probes, I know Bark is working on it, and some of the discussions we had, okay. uh, they 
do the job by killing the cancer cells uh, even more, you know, surely when they reach to the affected cells. Uh, but one has to be very careful about this drug delivery system because in some cases the receptors which are overexpressed uh, in the cancer situation they can be present on the normal cells also so as they enter into the normal cells as well as cancer cells uh, it can kill both type of cells and there would be side effects so as far as i know there are specific proteins maps like receptin trust to you map that has been very successfully used as a base protein in order to level them and and reach the target site so it is possible okay the other thing is the protein is basically neutral molecule right the protein is, is a neutral molecule Yes. Right, no? So you are using cation exchange resin, and then anion exchange. So how do you make yes. it? Uh, the other way, generally for synthetic organic chemists, we use silicon gel as a carpet. Right? You, you use, uh, so I heard, uh, if I have understood it clearly, they are physiological molecules. They can uh, be, uh, can have interaction with the cation exchange and anion exchange, and then, no, how do you want it in a condition? Because generally proteins are neutral molecules. So in the acidic condition, it may go to cardiac okay, right? Okay. So, right. Uh, so distance, which part will be protonated? Right. Okay. I understood. So the protein molecules they have PI value, isoelectric point. Okay. Isoelectric point is uh, the combination of positively charged amino acids and negatively charged amino acids. Yeah, as part is. Now, when you want to utilize cation exchange for a protein molecule for purification, yeah. based on the PI value, you determine a pH of the solution so okay. that your side chains remain protonated okay. and it binds to the cation exchange. Okay. And the reverse is true for anion exchange. Okay. The other question is, in IR spectra, we saw that amide bond corresponds to 1640 centimeter amide bond, then 1551 corresponds to amide bond, right? 16, you are talking about 16? Deamidation. Infrared spectra. Okay. We saw two peaks corresponding to 1640 centimeter inverse amide bond. Right. Then another one is 1551 amide bond. Right. So in what way they are different? Okay, so characteristically every protein molecule will show the bands in those regions and that depends on the carbonyl group and the NH linkage. Right. So that basically reflects the structural you know characteristic property. So yes. MI1 that way is uh, from a library of structure one can Easily say to this day, amide one signifies the beta conformation. That is known, that is known. But why there is a difference in under centimeter difference, under centimeter inverse between the two structures? Why? That way, the CO bond, the CO bond will be more weaker, more longer. Right? Uh, can you repeat that when, again? When you go from 16 party to 1551, there is a difference right. of under centimeter inverse. Okay, so okay. that depends on those carbonyl or the functional groups, you know. Yes, there is a difference. Why there is a? It means. That's why the degree is 100 centimeter difference. You are seeing it. Generally, simple carbonyl will come around 1720. The moment you put the amide, because of the low para of electron and nitrogen participate, they give amido amido. It becomes the CO bond, it goes from 1720 to 1640. That's why. Now it is going further down, 1640 to 1650. So a protein molecule will have uh, all these groups, functional groups, right? Like we said, amide bond, the carbonyl group, and all. So yes. amide to that region is specific for certain groups. 
which is okay. which is carbonyl and the amide groups. So every protein okay. molecule will give you amide one and amide two band. Okay. There would be no no difference between the protein molecules, but the, the what would be the difference? The propensity of those bands. If it is alpha helical, actually FTIR is not a FTIR is not a good technique for helical protein, but it is a good technique to assess the beta structural protein. And okay, okay, two. Hello. One more sentence. Mi2 really does not uh, signify any protein structure. Mi1 does signify protein structure. Oh, thank you, sir. So now there are two more questions from the amount of So you are using ionic chain column, right? You are using ionic chain column. Are there preparative chain column? I don't know number, sir. Hello. Please repeat that. I could not hear you. Yeah, you are using ionic chain column, right? Right. Are they preparative scale column? Oh yes, yes. They are very large scale. In when you work in industry, you actually uh, run the commercial scale at five thousand liter, where the column size would be two hundred liter or hundred liters. And in R&D, the data I have shown you, these are coming out from 10 liters or 50 liters columns. So these are very large preparative and uh, industry scale column. Yes. Okay. So the next question is, what do you mean by mixed column? Mixed mode, uh, okay. So remember I show you the ligand structure. So the ligand that has been docked on the agarose or cepharose, it has two functional groups. One is the quaternary ammonia group and then the benzene ring. The benzene ring will allow you to have hydrophobic interaction and the quaternary ammonia group will allow you to have the anion exchange property, right? And okay. you have the hydrocarbon chain that helps yeah. you to have the hydrogen bond formation. So that's why we have OH group also in that. Uh, yeah, you have OH group, hydroxyl group. Uh, can't can't get you again. What did you say, please? See, you have a quaternary ammonium salt, that's nitrogen group. You have a phenyl group. You have a OH group, hydroxyl group, OH group. Okay, so let me then uh, open that presentation again and share it. Oh, yeah. Okay, so can you see the presentation? Yes. Can you see my slide? Okay, so you see, so hydrogen bond will happen between the two ele electronegative element, right? So you have hydroxyl group here, and the protein has also your uh, image group, yeah. Now, between O and N, there can be a hydrogen bond always. And yeah. it's a combination of many things. Yes. So you see the hydroxyl group. So these are what definitely. Is what is it combination? What is the? Combination. Combination means? Uh, did you say combination? Do you do you want to say combination? Combination. Professor, we would like to know whether the reverse phase Yes, this is okay. Now, when you say reverse phase here, uh, Normally, you for aqueous chromatography, you don't call it reverse phase. You actually use partition coefficient. That means this chromatography will allow you to purify protein at higher salt concentration. And at higher salt concentration, the protein hydrophobic patches, they will get clustered without hampering the 
native structure and then they can bind to the hydrophobic you know ligands of the chromatography system so i would not call it reverse phase i will say uh, hydrophobic interaction if you have to use reverse phase you have to use organic solvent and in the process you will denature the protein so normally we don't use reverse phase uh, for protein purification Okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, okay, so now on the thank you. In the meeting, I would like to thank Doctor Sanjay Bhattacharya for his excellent lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are facing some network problem, and the next lecture will start after five minutes. Sorry for the inconvenience.
ആ ഓക്കെ 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 welcome all uh, sorry for the interruption we are going to start our second talk of today i'm requesting dr kannan to start the session again thank you good morning to all once again today the second united talk is by dr tk samarkar he is a chief superintendent and officer in charge of control research and development department running corporation of india he is his research interests are environmental chemistry electrochemical chemistry phytometallurgy mineral processing in many of our some of the few awards are uh, group achievement award 2009 for the department of atomic energy on process flow state for the recovery of uranium metal from the Dhamana Pandi Ward, Kadapa District. It is about 17 years experience in the area of uranium recovery and purification. At present, he is working in the uranium population of India. We have around 18 international publications and there are many papers in international conferences and seminars. So, with this, I would like to invite Dr. Peter Dhamarkar on the topic Advantages and Challenges in Precipitation of uranium peroxide and Indian scenario. Dr. Dharma Kattis. Dr. Tarmarkar, kindly unmute yourself. Uh, respected Chairman, sir. I, Dr. P.K. Tamurga, today I am going to deliver talk on advantage entitled Advantages and Challenges in Precipitation of Uranium Peroxide Indian Scenario. As we know, Uranium Corporation of India Limited is playing a key role in nuclear fuel cycle. UCL has a mandate to mine and process of uh, uranium ore for, to meet the requirement of uh, nuclear power reactors. At present, in UCIL, we are operating eight mines and three processing plant for producing LOK. Two process plant working in East Simhum area, Jharkhand, where we are producing uranium peroxide and where it's one process plant working in uh, Tumlapalli, Kadapa district, Andhra Pradesh, where LOK produced as a sodium diuranate. diuranate. The precipitation of uranium LOK is a key a very important activity of uranium ore processing plant because it depends the selection of precipitation process depend on many factors but the most important factors are leaching process and characteristic of leach liquor so first i before talking about the precipitation of LOK, i would like to uh, describe about the process what we have adopted in our process plants particularly in east singhum area the ore characteristic of this Jadugada and surrounding area, the host rock is quartz chloride cyst. That's why we are uh, adopting acid leaching process. Whereas in Tumrapalli, the host rock is dolistian, so we are using this alkaline leaching process. In East Singhum area, we have two process plants. One is Jadugada mill and second one is Turamdi mill. In Jadugara mill, we are processing four mines ore, Jadugara, Bhatin, Bagjata, and Narva Pahar mine ore. We are in Turamdi, Turamdi mine ore, Bandugrang mine ore, and Maldi mine ore. The major activities of uranium ore processing are supply of uranium ore from different mines, crushing, grinding, leaching, 
solid liquid separation, purification and preconcentration, iron separation, product precipitation, and tailing disposal. This is the process flow sheet which we have adopted here in Jadugra process plant. The similar pro process flow sheet we are adapting here in Thromdi plant also. So, as we know, from uh, mines, we are getting the ore in big boulder farm. So first job is to crush the ore and reduce the size. So for that purpose, in our process plant, we have uh, installed jaw crusher and cone crusher. And after crushing this material, the whole material goes for grinding purpose. For that purpose, we have installed here rod mill and wall mill combination. And after grinding this material, we are getting in desired size, 60% minus 200 mils. Since it's a hydrometallurgical hydro process, so we are uh, using this uh, weight grinding method here. This ground material goes for leaching purpose. The leaching, here we are doing sulfuric acid leaching and we are adding parlucite and oxidant. And after leaching, after 12 hours leaching, this leached slurry, we are filtering it for solid and liquid separation. In ER Jadugra, we are uh, filtering through drum filter, and but in Tramdi, we have installed this uh, belt filter. After filtration and solid liquid separation, solid portion means cake portion goes for magnetite separation, and the liquor portion goes for clarification purpose. Because uh, in our leach liquor contains a lot of slimes, so this slimes uh, we have to remove to clarify the liquor. So for that purpose, this liquor we are passing through the pre-coat filter. After uh, filtration through pre-coat filter, this liquor goes for ion exchange circuit for purification and concentration purpose. The concentration of uranium in actually in liquor is very low because the ore grade, what we are processing in India, is very, very low grade ore. So concentration is very low grade uh, uranium concentration we are getting in leach liquor. So, the, to purify and concentrate purpose, we are passing this liquor through ion exchange circuit. After ion adsorption of uranium, and then this uh, uranium we are eluting by brine solution. After uh, elution, this solution goes for iron precipitation because it, it's contained lot of iron. So this iron we are removing by adding lime slurry at 3.5 pH, and then this IGC cake we are recycling into leaching circuit. And after this IVC separation, this liquor goes for uranium peroxide precipitation. Now I complete this cake portion. Whatever cake is generated in uranium ore process plant, because it's contained around 3% magnetite, so this magnetite, we are separating this material by passing through magnetic drum separator. And we are producing the magnetite byproduct in our process plant. After magnetite recovery, this whole material goes for neutralization purpose because we are using sulfuric acid. So the slurry, pH of the slurry is very low, around 2 pH. So this pH, we have to correct it up to 9 above 9.5 and then we are at uh, our disposal purpose. So we are neutralizing by lime slurry. After neutralization, whole material goes for coarse and fine separation through hydrocyclone. So coarse portion we are using for backfilling purpose into mines and fine portion goes for tailing disposal. Now I describe about the leaching process. In Jadugura mill, we are using pachukas for leaching purpose, but in Turamdi, we are using this leaching tanks. And here in leaching process, we are using sulfuric acid. So while adding sulfuric acid, we are maintaining the pH 1.7 to 1.8. Uh, EMF, we, we are maintaining 450 to 500 millivolt uh, by addition of pilocyte and temperature we are giving around 55 to 60 degrees Celsius. Retention time we are giving 12 hours, then grind side we are maintaining 60% minus 200 mass, 60% so, um, minus 200 mass. Then pulp density of the slurry we are maintaining 58 to 60% solid. The reagents uh, we are using only here in leaching concentrated sulfuric acid and pyrocyte. And after 12 hours leaching, this leak, leak slurry goes for uh, filtration purpose. But before that, I want to speak about the chemistry of leaching process because it's a very important process of uranium extraction. 
In MRO, actually, urine is present in tetravalent state. So, first job is to oxidize in this, uh, into hexavalent because tetravalent uranium is slight soluble in water, but hexavalent is totally soluble. So, that purpose, we are adding pilocyte to oxidize ferrous to ferric, and this ferric oxidize tetravalent uranium to hexavalent uranium. Up. Then, after clarification of leach liquor, solid liquid separation, uh, this liquor goes for ion exchange circuit. Here, we are using ammonical anion, ex, anion exchange region. So, this uh, region adsorbs uranium sulfate, and this uranium sulfate we are eluting through brine solution. And after elution, this goes for IGC separation. But whatever re, uh, re, dilute uranium solution, are uh, generated during the ion exchange circuit, we are recycling it in our ion uh, process plant. But before going for precipitation through this solution, we are doing iron separation because iron is the major impurity for our uh, final product. So this iron removal is very, very essential because in eluted liquor, we are getting around uh, 1 to 1.5 GPL concentration of iron. So, by adding lime slurry at 3.5 pH, we are precipitating this whole iron and recycled in leaching circuit because iron is a very essential element during the leaching. This is the arrangement what we have made in our process plant for IGC separation. Here you can see the composition of leach liquor, chloride eluted liquor, uh, before iron precipitation and after iron precipitation. Uh, here we can see he, after uh, separation of iron, the iron concentration in eluted liquor comes down at up to 5 to 15 ppm. The chloride eluted solution, uh, we are using for final product precipitation. Earlier, in our uh, process plant, we have MDU was precipitated by, addis, by addition of MDU slurry of 50, 15 to 20 percent by maintaining pH 6.5 to 7 and retention time around six hours, but the MDU has some disadvantages. The grade of the MDU was very low and the high, it contained high silica and other impurities also present in the MDU because of co-precipitation of other metals because the precipitation is done by around six to seven pm. MDU contains insoluble impurities in nitric acid which generate UNRC during the further refining process at NFC. Handling and processing of best disposal of UNFC is also difficult. The precipitation of, uh, that's why due to overcome of this disadvantage of MDU, the R&D efforts were taken for uh, producing some alternate product. That's why R&D was carried out to produce uranium peroxide. But the perox uh, uranium peroxide precipitation is not an easy task from chloride eluted solution. Why? Because it's a lean grade liquor, impurity level is very high, and there are many factors affecting the precipitation efficiency and grade of the product. I would like to express some here, some major factors which affecting the precipitation efficiency and recovery and grade of uranium peroxide. pH, temperature during precipitation, precipitation time or retention time, quantity of hydrogen peroxide added, iron concentration in eluted solution, magnesium concentration in eluted solution, and calcining temperature on product. The effect of pH on recovery. A number of experiments were conducted on different pH, but it was observed that 3.5 pH is the optimum pH to get maximum recovery of uranium peroxide. And above 3.5 pH, in some cases, we have uh, observed that recovery goes down. Effect of temperature on precipitation. Temperature effect during the iron uranium peroxide precipitation is very vital. We got hydrogen peroxide on high temperature decompose. So with the increase of temperature, the recovery decreases and grade of the product also decreases. 
but we in our case we have uh, observed that in 26 degrees celsius maximum recovery move we have obtained effect of precipitation time the recovery increases with the increase in precipitation time the excess quantity of hydrogen peroxide is required to make complete precipitation of uranium peroxide it was observed that excess some excess quantity of hydrogen peroxide does not affect on recovery after certain level in our case 28.6 percent excess hydrogen peroxide is generally required towards the stoichiometric ratio effect of iron concentration as the iron is a major impurity in our liquor so with the increased concentration of iron in a chloride eluted solution the recovery and grade of the product decreases if we want to uh, achieve the recovery, then we have to add more hydrogen peroxide. But in this case also, the product grade will not be improved. The manganese concentration is very important uh, in uranium peroxide because the grade of the product decreases very drastically in, with the increase of manganese concentration in our chloride in the solution. The on recovery, there is very less effect. After precipitation of uranium peroxide, this peroxide powder we have uh, heated on different temperature, and we have observed that with the increase of temperature, this uranium peroxide grade is increases because the, this hydration of uh, water will be removed. Whatever parameters we have optimized on lab scale, on the parameter we have done a uh, large scale testing at pH 3.5, retention time 4 hours, excess hydrogen peroxide 26 point of stoichiometric ratio, temperature ambient, and recovery above 99%. Large scale testing was done, and about pilot scale we have produced this uh, uranium peroxide, and then finally we have decided to implement in our process plant. This is the process what we have adopted in for precipitation of urine peroxide in our process plant. Urine peroxide precipitated by addition of 50% uh, hydrogen peroxide by maintaining the pH 3.5 by ammonia. No external temperature is required to complete the reaction. Four numbers of agitated tank are used to maintain the residence time. Uranium peroxide precipitate is thickened in high rate thickener for further processing in a, as usual. Overflow of HRT recycled to the system as a second EL for elution purpose in our ionization system. Underflow of means thickened slurry of uranium peroxide filtered with belt, horizontal belt filter. And then chloride we are removing by washing through with water. Then Uranium peroxide first dried at 100 degrees Celsius in the speed dryer, and then again it dried in the rotary kiln at 350 degrees Celsius. This is the process flow sheet which we have adopted in our process plant for precipitation of uranium peroxide. This is the arrangement what we have made in our process plant. Similar arrangement which we, uh, earlier we are using for uh, this MDU precipitation, same tanks we are using for uranium peroxide precipitation. So they, we have nothing we have added in this process plant. Now, this the, we can say uh, this comparison of product to a quality. Here you can be, we can say we can see this uh, uranium peroxide is much purer than. MMDU. Earlier in MDU, we were getting around U3 at content 72 to 75 percent, but now we are getting around 89 to 92 percent. Moisture 5 to 6 percent in MDU, but it's reduced 0.5 to 1.5 only. Chloride almost same, sulfate is almost same, but silica drastically low. We are getting in uranium peroxide 0 0.05 to 0.2 percent only, and MDU almost nil in uranium peroxide. This is the product appearance at 100 degrees Celsius uranium peroxide and 350 degrees Celsius at uranium peroxide. 
So while implementation of this uranium peroxide in our process plant, all safety aspects thoroughly analyzed and arrangements are made in process plant for safety point of view. So for that purpose, addition of hydrogen peroxide done in by auto sampler, pH controller and ammonia addition agent also closed loop, automatic level transmitter, tripping of pump are in control loop, pH and residual peroxide continuously monitored, drying plant operation is fully automatic, peroxide plant operation is also automatic, peroxide plant product filling stitch point has been enclosed with glass chamber, negative suction with the help of exact as per recommendation of ARV. Human interference at this stage is almost negligible and all workers working in product distribution area, spray dyeing plant, peroxide plant have been provided TLD gadgets, respirator and other safety gadgets. Time to time, recommendation given by ARB in terms of safety being implemented strictly by UCI. Over implementation of this uh, uranium peroxide in our process plant, we have observed many advantages. Uranium peroxide precipitation technique by using hydrogen peroxide and ammonia is very selective and effective in operation. The, this peroxide, uh, uranium peroxide is very much purer than magnesium diuranate. Since we are uh, precipitating this uranium peroxide 3.5 pH, pH, so we have, uh, by this way, we have prevented all co precipitation of other metals. And there is no change in working environment. Environment friendly as required, as least amount of ammonia is required. Easily soluble in this uranium peroxide, very easily soluble in nitric acid. And uh, in uranium peroxide, while in, uh, doing refinery uh, refining process in further, where UNRC is almost nil generated. Problem of nitrate handling will also minimize at NFC. Although a number of challenge, uh, number of advantages in uranium peroxide precipitation, but there are some challenges because hydrogen peroxide addition is more required in continuous mode than compare in comparison to optimized at level scale at batch mode. The always trace amount of unreacted hydrogen peroxide remaining in barren liquid, which is further as recycled through ion exchange circuit as eluent. This residual hydrogen peroxide is eluent is deteriorating our ion exchange region, resulting decrease in loading capacity of ion exchange region. By this, actually regeneration, uh, frequency of regeneration also increased in our process plant. So this removal of excess unreacted hydrogen peroxide from barren wood is very, very essential. And storage and handling of hydrogen peroxide and ammonia is also required very special care. As already told, the removal of excess hydrogen peroxide is uh, very, very important. So we have done some experiments on removal of this hydrogen peroxide. So number of reagents we have tried, but finally we have got that these uh, reagents are effective, but they will uh, affect our downstream process. So we cannot recommend for removal of uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, by these chemicals. So other way, we have uh, done some experiments by heating this varan elevate by te increasing temperature. And a number of experiments were conducted at 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70 degrees Celsius. And finally, we have observed that around 95% removal efficiency we can achieve at 50 degrees Celsius temperature with, within five hours. And after uh, heating, this whole solution is then cooled and then used as a uh, barren elevate in a second year in our process plant. Finally, Looking at the advantages, features, and other industrial requirements, such as good filtration characteristics, appreciable rate of settling, amenability to doing drying, and uh, easy in handling, and uh, its ability to meet the specification of nuclear fuel industry, uranium peroxide, we can say uranium peroxide is the most suitable product for considering characteristics of Indian uranium ore. At the end, I would like to thank organizer of the conference for providing this opportunity to give in a invited talk. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Dr. is over for discussion. Any questions? No.
Hello. Yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Okay. A very nice talk. Actually, I wanted to congratulate you that UCL is playing a very key role in uh, ensuring that our indigenous PHWRs are uh, really running well. Without your cooperation, uh, it will be uh, it will be almost impossible to run our NPCL PHWR program. My question is: You see, you have uh, compared uh, two. Uh, method MDU and the peroxide method and uh, then yes, you sir. have uh, said that the recovery is much better in the peroxide method almost I think 10 to 12 percent uh, increase is there so the question is whether you also observe that in the downstreams that is the discharge effluents and all that the uranium concentration is lower in the peroxide method no, actually, I am talking about recovery of uh, recovery of uranium peroxide. Recovery of uranium peroxide in terms of uh, efficient precipitation efficiency and by uh, precipitation by hydrogen peroxide. Actually, uh, overall recovery is almost the same. Earlier also we are getting around eighty percent recovery, and uh, at present also we are getting uh, we are getting eighty percent recovery. Okay. Okay. So now there are few more questions here. I lost. Uh, Doctor Kamrata, the first question yes, is uh, how do you distinguish between different uranium sources that is from different mines? From the forensic part. Uh, as far as Jalaji uh, is concerned, sir. Yeah. How do you distinguish yes. the different uranium sources from different mines? Right. Uh, as already okay, 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 sir. Uh, as already shown in first second slide, when characteristic of one depend on the characteristic of wood. Suppose in Jadugara uh, wood, we are the hot rock. It's chloride cyst, quartz cyst. So by testing, if this is uh, best for the acid leaching purpose, but in Tumnapal case, we can say the host rock is dull stone. Suppose we go for the acid leaching purpose, then very high acid consuming material is there. And after that, uh, we are getting a very silicious, uh, sil silicious type of slurry, and we are not able to filter it. So ultimately, we have to, uh, to host rock, we have to for alkaline leaching. So the characteristics of our is the main factor for uh, deciding the leaching process. Okay. The the second question. Is, okay. So how the tailings are managed after uranium recovery? The tailings. Yes, sir. Yes. How yes. Sir. Yes. How tailings are managed after uranium recovery? After recovering uranium, what do you do with the tailings? Tailings. Uh, yeah. We are uh, after after leaching. We are uh, this uh, filtering the this whole slurry, and then we are first we are magnetite separating magnetite, and then after neutralization we are uh, doing separation of force and fines, and then fine portion only we are uh, discharging into tailing point. Hey, what are the other What are the other elements other than iron and manganese in the board? In which telling, sir? Yeah. No, no, in the ore. Other, in ore, <laughs> other element, there are yeah. copper, moly, and uh, some nickel also, but at very test level. And this, how these elements are separated? We are, uh, okay. earlier we are producing this uh, byproduct, copper, moly, and uh, nickel, but now because of Narva, introduce of Narva, and other mines, Pandu Grangada, it's contain very low even low other metals so we have completed this uh, byproduct have been stopped actually okay so only many we are covering any byproduct okay is it chemistry wise means iron it is not feasible oh same so, okay iron is coming as a main uh, what is called commodity that's why separating iron with using manganese right so chemistry wise right. iron copper nickel then are mm -hmm. similar problem. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. How do you separate? That's the question they ask. Uh, now we are not separating actually. What is then? I only earlier is my earlier the flotation method earlier in flotation method we are separating this copper nickelic sulfides, but now we have stopped actually this. Okay. The next question is how do you the, how do the temperature is maintained at twenty five degrees centigrade in the liquid star? Uh, in during the RN uh, this uh, uranium peroxide precipitation. Ah. Uh, actually, this is actually, 26 actually we can say ambient temperature, okay. ambient, so 26 to 30. Okay, and uh, another question is, could you comment on the reusability of manganese dioxide as accident or hmm? by simply it is due to Fe2, Fe3, whether you can reuse that manganese dioxide? Uh, pardon sir, pardon sir, I am not able to understand your question sir. Manganese dioxide, MnO2. Ha, Hello? Yeah, whether you can use manganese dioxide. Yes, we are using manganese dioxide. Whether you can reuse MnO2. No, 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 sir, no. Oh, okay. Because I know one question. Mm-hmm. In the process description, you go to process description. Mm-hmm. The slide. Just one. Uh, just yeah, just one. Just, no, next question. Next, next slide. Here. No, no. Process description. Process description. Okay. Uh, regarding this uh, uranium peroxide. Yeah, yeah, you are right. Same. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, just one. Here, here, one. Ha ha. Right. Yeah. Okay, you see the equation. You know, it's mm-hmm. with hydrogen peroxide in water and you give UO4 to H2O. What yes, is the balance yes, of uranium here? Hello? What is the balance of uranium here? UO4 to H2O. Uranium ka balance is how U04, you have put it. Yes, yes, yes. The balance of uranium is 8. Is it possible? Eight. Yes, it is possible. You put uranium U04. 2, I said 2. Yes, sir. U04, 2H2O. No, it is not possible. You can put U03, it is possible. It is not 4. Uh, okay, okay. The balance of uranium is 8. And also, in the moment you put hydrogen peroxide, it may be, it may mm-hmm. not be UO3, it may be oxygen hydroxide also, possibility. Okay, sir. Okay, because still it is in sulfuric acid medium. And right, right, right. Acid medium, UO3 cannot exist. It will be UO2 plus hydroxide, oxygen hydroxide. Right, okay. Okay, then equation, you check for the equation. That's not okay, right. okay, sir. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. No more questions. Thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor for kindly chairing this session. Uh, all the participants are now requested to switch on their videos so that we can take screenshot. All participants are requested to switch on their videos kindly. We will have an uh, e-break for now and we will reassemble for the next technical session at 11.30. Thank you.